following the events of the previous episode. Tiak has a nightmare about the time he had a gold symbiote transplantation. He wakes up in the SGC when he's informed by SG-1 and Dr. Fraser that their experiment failed. They try to remove his snake and stabilize his body functions with various drugs. But it didn't work, the Jaffa almost died and they had to reimplant it. Fast forward to the debriefing, and Dr. Fraser's only certainty that came out of the experiment is that the Goa'uld is literally a Jaffa's immune system. Tiak suggests to go back to Chulak and to steal a few larval snakes for medical experiments. However, General Hammond can't authorize returning to Apophis's home base, which the former First Prime seems to take personally. Colonel O'Neill meets up with the warrior in his room and finds out that he wants to return to Chulak because he wants to save his son Ryak from his first transplantation, the Primtar. He also casually mentions to have left a wife on said planet. Being overwhelmed by this, Jack reminds Tiak that he made an oath to the general that he left no ties back on Chulak, but he answers that he couldn't trust them yet. The colonel brings forward the suggestion once more to General Hammond, but he immediately shoots the mission down. SG-1 is trying to convince him that the benefits justify the risks, such as, for example, recruiting more rebellious Jaffa. But when the general digs a little deeper, it turns out that there's only one rebel Jaffa on Shulag. Also, SG-1 has no idea where the lava gold are being kept. That's the moment when the general has enough and takes O'Neill into a little private one-on-one -on -one in his office. The general demands from Jack the truth as he is not an idiot. And if the leader of SG-1 doesn't tell him immediately what the real purpose behind the mission is, then the colonel can, frankly speaking, go screw himself. Being stuck between his loyalty for Tiak and his loyalty to the US Air Force, O'Neill admits that the true purpose is to locate his unmentioned son Ryak and prevent the Primtar, in addition to locating his wife and said Jafar rebel. Hammond is taken aback by this, realizing that not only has Tiak betrayed his former allegiance, but also left behind his family in an attempt to fight for his ideals. This is when said Jafar forcibly overtakes the gate room and dials the Chulak. The general corners him and makes it clear to him that he won't make it very far on his own. Which, naturally, would lead to a one-way trip into a torture chamber. That is why, after considering his feelings, Hammond greenlights the mission and sends Tiak alongside the rest of SG-1 back to Chulak. They also have less than 24 hours until the Primta is happening. SG-1 mantles some disguise and they step through the gate. Coming out on the other side, Tiak manages to get the team past the guards by almost breaking the head priest's hand. Acted by Brian Jensen, uh, the character, uh, of course, not the hand. You, you get my, you get what I mean. They ditch their disguise and move on to Tiak's old house, only to find it being burned down and marked with the brand of the Sholva, the symbol of traitors. Captain Carter says that there is no reason to believe that his family was burned down alongside their house, which is when they are ambushed by the first prime of Apophis, portrayed by Tony Amendola, that sexy beast, who Tiag recognizes and greets as Greytech. The first prime tells his former student that his family escaped before the burning began, and they have migrated to a refugee camp outside of town. You challenge me, Hashak? Uh, no, I don't think we came to fight you. A shit. The old Jafar recognizes the skill of the colonel and helps him back up on his feet. Braytag tells him that most Jafar are wondering about the Tauri's fighting strength, because no one has ever survived a large-scale resistance against the gold and lived to tell about it. Old Jafar and angry Jafar make a plan to search the refugee camps to find his family, with the colonel ordering Carter and Jackson to take ambushing positions around the gate as Jack intends to follow the warriors. On their way back to the Stargate, Sam and Daniel spot a heavily guarded caravan of sort, so they decide to follow them and find out what's going on. Tiak, Braytag and Jack find the refugee camp. In the farthest away tent, he finds a priest tending to his son Ryak. He offers the priest a peaceful solution, but the holy man grabs a knife and attacks. In the midst of battle, a cloaked person jumps on the Shova. Priest is dead and cloak person turns out to be Tiak's wife, Dreok, acted by Sally Richardson. The symbiote meant for transplantation is now dead, and Tiak has a one-on-one -on -one talk with Dreok. She accuses him of betrayal towards his own family. 
after which he gets pissed because he hears that Ryak has been told that Tyrk is dead. Ryak, portrayed by Neil Demus, wakes up and is in joy at seeing that his father is still alive. O'Neill recognizes the boy's sickness as scarlet fever and proceeds to give him some medicine he always carries around for this purpose. But he assures them that this isn't enough to cure it and that Ryak might have a chance of survival on Earth. Meanwhile, Carter and Jackson find one of the symbiote larval storage places. Captain Sam and Dr. Daniel raid the symbiote shrine once everybody leaves. Carter successfully catches a snake and wants to ditch as quickly as she can. But Jackson removes the safety on his weapon and begins to point aim. Let's go. Raytag and crew arrive in the Stargate's proximity but can't find Sam or Daniel. However, right now they have bigger problems on their hands because Ryak has stopped breathing. Tiag, in desperation, implants his own symbiote into his son, forcing him to fail the mission of preventing the Primter. The two scientists are ambushed by a Jafar patrol while walking nonchalantly on the road. But Carter got things under control and kills them with a grenade. They meet up with Braytex crew and give them the lava symbiote they stole. After the first Prime throws a hissy fit over this being sacrilege or something, he implants it into his old student personally. The group moves onwards when Ryak finally wakes up. He and his father have a short heart to heart, a promise to stand alongside in battle against the Growold. And Tiag tells him to stay with his mother to grow up as a warrior. SG-1 and Braytek move forward to clear the Stargate, but during the trip, Braytek assumes command. With only Tiag in disguise, Braytek approaches the head priest, telling him that he has captured the Tari and needs to deliver them immediately to Apophis personally. But the priest is not buying it. Set First Prime doesn't take no for an answer and even with the age of 133, he takes them all out with ease and without even using lethal force. Damn! I would like to know what Braytag was like in his youth. Anyway, Set First Prime promises Tiak to teach Ryak his ways just as he did with him back then and bids them farewell as SG-1 returns to Earth. And that was the 11th episode of the first season of Stargate SG-1. Overall, this episode is once again vital for the plot and plays a major influence in this season's finale. It also helps that this episode has good character development, everybody gets something to do, there's next to no wasted time and we get tons of lore as well. The episode is also well written and well acted. I just feel like the pacing is, once again, a little weird due to the script trying to fit one and a half episodes worth of content into a single one. At least that's what it feels like to me. Anyway, with that in mind, I may see you next time with my review of Thief Deadly Shadows. Until then, have a good one.